Okay, great. It was still the first day of school, and I did not know any English. There were no ESL classes. I was the only immigrant in a school of 300 American kids, and I was screwed. 17 years ago, I came from Shanghai, China, one of the biggest metropolises in Asia, to a small town called Palm Springs, California, where old golfers go to retire and where Coachella happens. Now, if you've ever wanted to know what it's like to suddenly have your IQ drop by 100 points, I highly recommend you to move to a different country and go through their school system. It works every time. Now, I had all of a sudden gone from being a student who had never gotten less than 90% in China to being held back a grade. And I had gone from learning about the birthdays of Communist Party leaders to learning about Jesus Christ on Friday Catholic Mass. I was very confused, and to say I was shocked would be an understatement. And things are about to get worse. A few weeks after my first day of class, I had a classmate come up to me at the drinking fountains. And she said, hey, Lee, my mom's Chinese, so her eyes look like this. And my dad's Japanese, so his eyes look like this. And when I was born, I look like this. I didn't know what to say at the time, but what bothered me more was the fact that I didn't know how to say it. I knew that I could not change my ethnicity. I could not change the way that I looked. And I realized the only difference between me and my American classmates was really the language. And I calculated that I was about 10 years far apart from them. But I made a vow to myself that no matter how long it took, even if it took 10 years, I was going to catch up with them. And so there were a lot of sacrifices that were made. I remember during the weekends when my classmates would watch the first Zoolander movie, so you can figure out how old I am now, um, I would be studying, oh, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And I remember I would be going, looking at recess, seeing my classmates playing handball, and I would be worrying about my next spelling test. And my first real test came in the form of a youth adult novel called, or young adult novel, called Island of the Blue Dolphins. Now, this book was harder for me than War and Peace, and I read War and Peace. And I remember the first time reading this book, and I had no idea what the book was about. Second time I read the book, okay, it's about a girl with her brother, with a dog, trapped on an island trying to get rescued. And the third time I read the book, I finally was able to pull off a C-minus book report, which I was okay with because I had finally read the most difficult book I would have to read in my life. And that perseverance and that persistence took me further and further. And within about a year, I went from being held back a grade to skipping a grade in sixth grade. And by the time I hit eighth grade, I was thankfully in all honors classes, and I was able to go to UC Berkeley and graduated. Now, for many of you guys, milestones are important. And many of you guys think that your life would just be amazing once you hit something. Maybe if you get your driver's license, your life would be perfect. Or you, know, you get your first boyfriend or girlfriend, your life would be perfect. Or if you just get to the right college, everything would be great. But actually, that's not true. And after I got into Berkeley and graduated, a couple months after graduation, I remember sitting on the floor of my Berkeley apartment wondering what the hell had happened. Because at that point, I had not only gotten no job offers, I hadn't even gotten a single interview. And I had done everything right. And I'm not saying this to scare high school students. I'm saying this because you can do everything right that other people tell you, but you have to be aware of what it is that you need to persevere through. Now, when I was younger, it meant escaping from criticism, escaping from judgment, avoiding being made fun of. And that was the precise thing I needed to learn to get a job. 
So I realized since I was so terrible at job searching my way, I was going to get rejected as much as possible. So just come hit me. So I sent out 100 unsolicited emails to CEOs around the Bay Area. And what I got was 90 rejections. Now, 90 rejections sounds bad, but after about the 60th, you kind of forget what it's like. And that's what life is about. You may have a man crush Monday. You may have a woman crush Wednesday that you pined over and they rejected you. But guess what? How are you going to solve this problem? By asking more people out by being out there in the dating scene because the job search is quite similar because it's not because you're not enough, it's because you're not talking to enough people. And the more you get rejected, the more you realize what you can tweak. For me, I realized I'm not supposed to say I'm antisocial over phone interviews. That doesn't get you the next one. And as I refined and tweaked things, I was finally able to get 10 interviews, two offers, and I finally accepted a business analyst job in San Francisco. And I was over the moon at that point. I finally had that big girl job in San Francisco, and my mom could get off my back about not being able to find a job. And here's the thing. There is a certain cycle and pattern to my life that I've noticed, that I can accomplish a lot, but also it slips away a lot. So after about six months, the contract was over, and I was let go. And I remember that January day walking around Union Square Mall in San Francisco with a pen and a notepad, furiously writing down what I wanted to do with my life. Because at that point, my life as I knew it was over. I had always dreamed of being this career woman, having all her stuff together. And now all of a sudden, with just one conversation, everything was gone. But there was one thing on my bucket list that kept popping up. But I just said to myself, oh, Lee, you're too young to do that. You're too female to do that. You're too Asian to do that. And that was actually starting a business. Now, a few months after I was let go, I was back at my mother's place. And I felt like a complete loser because I had just blown their dreams and she wasn't sure what I was going to do with my life. And at that rock bottom moment, life truly tests who you are. It tests how far you can go, how much you can persevere. And I decided that I was just going to give this business a shot. So what I did was that I did what any business owner who didn't know what they were doing would do. I put up an ad on Craigslist. I said that I could teach ESL to immigrant professionals because I was one myself. And lo and behold, somebody answered. So one of the clients that I met that definitely changed the course of my career was Mohammed. Now, Mohammed was a pharmacy owner back in Tehran, Iran. And he came to the US with a dream with his wife and his daughter to build out his American dream. Now, one thing was in the way. And if you can guess, yes, it was very much related to English. So he had to pass a TOEFL speaking exam in order to use his a pharmacy license to practice in the US, but he just could not pass this test, and he asked me to help him. So every single week for one hour, we would meet at Starbucks, and I would teach him what to say and what not to say, and we realized that his progress was not as fast as we could go, because uh, the fortunate thing was that I was thrown into an environment where I could not speak my native language, but he would go home and speak Farsi with his family and not have as much of a chance to practice. So one day I said, Mohammed, why don't you just get a part-time job? And his response kind of surprised me. He said, no, 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 I can't do that. And I asked him why. And funny enough, he was fired too, and he was fired for a better reason. So a, few, a year ago, while he was working at the factory, he was having problems communicating with his American female boss. And what he did was that he thought he could smooth things over with a gift. Now, unfortunately, that gift was a perfume bottle. And that caused a major misunderstanding, and his female boss let him go. But I said, Mohammed, you know, we can always try and start over again. We can always persist, because I know you can get a job. And he said, okay. 
So I was able to help him rewrite his resume and coach him on what to say on his interviews. And he was able to go from one year of unemployment to getting a job within two weeks at CVS as a pharmacy technician. So I did not know that I was, the struggles that I had was going to help somebody else. I didn't know that the academic side of my perseverance would hinder my career perseverance. But we always have to understand that perseverance is something that is a way of life. It's not something that you just stop once you hit college, something that you stop once you hit your job, something that you hit once you hit a business. But it's something that is all within us. So if you're going through struggles right now, know that it's not the end. This is just the beginning. And if you can overcome one obstacle, it means that you can overcome more. And had I not been able to overcome my obstacles before, I would not be able to help others. So I encourage you today to do something that you had your dream on, to do something every day that gets you closer to your dream, because it's not only going to help you, but someone else. Thank you so much.